Got your Bibles? Great. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 is where we'll be this morning. Um, You know, it's incredibly wonderful to be back in the study of the book of Revelation as a church. And last Sunday, Pastor John opened up the first six verses of chapter 20. And this morning, Lord willing, and the water doesn't continue to rise around here, we'll... um, We'll be in verses 7 through 15, the the rest of that chapter this morning. But but last Sunday, we saw a time that is to come of utopian-like peace on the earth, with Jesus ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Does that sound good to anybody? Yeah. A thousand years of Jesus reigning on earth. This morning, as we finish the chapter, chapter 20, we're really going to consider two things that come after that time. Number one, the ultimate defeat of Satan. Anyone looking forward to that? Yes. The ultimate defeat of Satan, our enemy. And then secondarily this morning, what we see in this chapter is the ultimate judgment, which is known as the great white throne judgment. Chapter 20 opens with this time, this time that's been prophesied about throughout the Old Testament, where Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years. Utopian-like society on earth, that which was wrong being made right. And today, we'll see the enemy finally judged and this time of ultimate judgment. Do you remember that time, feels like years ago now, where we began our study in the book of Revelation? Anyone remember that? We had a theme, we had a focus that Jesus loves his church, right? We witnessed together Jesus' love, his tenderness, and his toughness for his church. His love was revealed in those first five chapters of the book. You know, Pastor Warren Wearsby, he says this about the book of Revelation. He says, Revelation gives us the privilege, the privilege of seeing the glorified Christ in heaven and the fulfillment of his sovereign purposes in the world. Revelation is the open book in which God reveals his plans and his purposes to us, his church. You know, as you read the gospel accounts of Jesus, we're introduced to Jesus who came as one born in a manger, born to to peasant parents, as it were, who came as a servant, who came as the promised Messiah, who came as the promised King, who was the Son of God, to die on the cross and to rise again to conquer sin, death, and the grave, and then to ascend into heaven. But in the book of Revelation, as Wearsby just said, we get the privilege of seeing Jesus as he is now. As he is now, glorified. I mean, in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, John, the author, gives us a tremendous description of the person of Jesus. Let me remind you that he is glorious. Let me just read to you a little bit from that first chapter, chapter 1, verse 13. John writes this, And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. Do you remember reading the Gospels? That was a phrase that Jesus often used of himself to describe himself, the Son of Man. John says he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire, his feet like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice, he says his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. And he held the seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, and his face, his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. Jesus is glorious. That's who he is, as the resurrected, glorified Christ. He's also God. Verse 8 of chapter 1, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the what? Does anyone know? 
the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is to come. I am the Almighty One. Jesus loves church. In that first chapter of the book of Revelation, we see that Jesus is glorious. His voice is like the sound of mighty oceans, thunderous waves. He claims to be the Alpha and the Omega. He's glorious. He's God. But also, he's got everything in his hands. I'm convinced that verse 5 of chapter 1 is where that little song comes from. Chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, he's the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. See, the book of Revelation opens up with a revelation, a revealing unto us who Jesus is, that he's glorious, that he's God, and that he's got everything in his hands. In chapters 2 and 3, we, we come across these, these seven letters that are written to seven churches that actually existed in that area of Asia Minor. And in those churches, in those letters that he writes, Jesus authoring these words, they're penned in red in our Bibles today, we see this grouping, the people of Jesus. And in these letters, we're given clarity to Jesus' love, encouraging, commending, warning, and teaching. Chapters 4 and 5, we're, we're given the perspective with Jesus. If chapter 1 is all about the person of Jesus, the second and third chapters are about the people of Jesus. Well, chapters 4 and 5, perspective with Jesus, do you know what's central there? It's heaven. It's heaven. I mean, chapter 4, verse 1, John says this, I looked and I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here. I'll show you what things must happen after this. The preeminent focus in heaven is God's sovereignty and God's holiness. Verse 11 of chapter 4, it says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. Does that sound like a God who's out of control or who's in control? In control. Chapter 5, verse 13 says, Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. See, as we opened up the study of the book of Revelation, which again, seems like eons ago, we saw Jesus' love for the church. We see who he is in his person. We see his people. We see the perspective that Jesus is in control. He created all things. He has a plan. And the book of Revelation reveals to us who Jesus is and unfolds a bit of that plan that is to come. And so in, in the second part of our study of this book, we, we kind of considered chapters 6 through 19 together as a whole. And we see God's justice poured out upon the world. We're given some amazing descriptions in those chapters of one who is to come known as the Antichrist, the false prophet, these 144,000 witnesses that God's going to use during the time of tribulation. Earthquakes, and he raises up these two witnesses that come from heaven, these signs and symbols, and this description of the woman and the dragon, and the description of the army of the Lord. We saw the seven seal judgments, the trumpets and the bowls. We saw the battle of Armageddon in which Jesus returns with the sword of his mouth and defeats the armies of the Antichrist. The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. And Jesus returns in what's known as the millennial age, that, that thousand years of peace upon the earth. And our theme, our, our focus of that time, that part two of the book of Revelation, is that there's judgment for sin but there's always mercy, always a call for repentance. Why? Well, it's true that Jesus loves the church, but it's also true that Jesus is full of mercy and justice, right? 
Now, as we begin to wrap up our study of the book of Revelation, we're coming to something that is significantly marvelous. This idea, this concept, this final theme that Jesus overcomes. Jesus overcomes. That, that's what these last couple of chapters in the book of Revelation reveal to us. Last Sunday, we saw that there's this time to come of this peace on earth with Jesus ruling and reigning for a thousand years. And this morning, as we look at the close of this chapter, we'll see the ultimate defeat of Satan and the ultimate judgment known as the great white throne judgment. So let's pick up the story, Revelation chapter 20, looking at the ultimate defeat of Satan. We'll start reading in verse 7, and I'll read through verse 10. This morning I'm reading out of the New Living Translation of the Bible. We'll pray, and then we'll begin to break it down. Verse 7, when the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people in the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. And there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Father, as we open your word this morning, as we consider this text in context of all that you're doing in the book of Revelation, Lord, I would just ask ever so humbly, ever so simply that you would open up our hearts to what the Spirit of God says through the Word of God. Jesus, you said in the letters to the churches that are recorded here that those that have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, let them hear. God, I pray that for us this morning, that our eyes of understanding would be open, that the ears of our hearts, so to speak, would be sensitive EQ'd to the voice of your spirit. God, that you would bring encouragement where we need it. You'd bring perspective. You'd bring conviction. Lord, you would illuminate the truth of your word to our hearts. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the book of Revelation, that it reveals to us who you are and a bit of what you're doing. Lord, I pray that our souls would be settled in the truth that, Jesus, you overcome all things. And as we sang this morning, we're fighting battles that you have already overcome. So, Lord, may our hearts be entrusted solely into your hands, the one who's got all things together. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, this week I heard a familiar story that that maybe you've heard before of an elderly woman, a woman who lived in an apartment right next door to a man who was an atheist. And, and the two, even though the woman, the Christian woman, was gracious and kind, they didn't always get along. Perhaps you've heard this story before, that, that this woman was struggling, barely able to make ends meet and provide weekly for that typical grocery bill that would come. And oftentimes, this atheistic neighbor would hear this woman praying, thanking God for who he is, worshiping him. But one day, he heard her praying for enough groceries just to make it to dinner. And the neighbor, he thought, as he heard this woman praying, this is my opportunity to stick it to my neighbor, <laughs> to show her that my perspective, that there is no God, no gracious provider, no one who's got all things in his hands. This is my opportunity to show her that God doesn't exist, that he doesn't care. So this is what he did. The neighbor hears this prayer of this woman who's faithfully praying to God, asking for enough resource, enough food just to make it to dinner. He goes to the grocery store, 
buys everything he can think of that the woman might need and sets it at her door, rings the doorbell, and hides in the bushes. And then when the woman comes to answer the door, she answers it and says, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for providing. And at that moment, the neighbor rushes out with an aha. He said, I told you he doesn't exist. God didn't give you those groceries. I did. Do you see how foolish it is to believe in a God who doesn't exist? And the woman paused for a moment. Story goes, she looked up to heaven and prayed, God, you're amazing. Not only did you give me the food that I need, but you sent the devil to deliver my groceries. <laughs> I love that story. You know, it's cute, it's fun, but the dynamic is the devil is very real, right? Right? And here in Revelation chapter 20, we read about him being loosed after this thousand-year reign of Jesus. A thousand years without the enemy, without the devil deceiving and causing havoc upon the world. The devil is a formidable foe for God's people, has been since Genesis chapter 3. Think back to that. We're in the book of Revelation since Genesis chapter 3, we see this dynamic of the devil, the enemy, coming against the plans of God and the people of God. After the devil deceived Eve and Adam chose to disobey, God gave this prophecy in Genesis 3 that he would put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the devil between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. There's been this dynamic of this Heel snatcher, so to speak, this serpent seeking to thwart the purposes and plans of God. Ephesians chapter 6, Pastor Joe Prestridge a couple weeks ago talked about this dynamic, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers, authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. The devil's real. Pastor Warren Wearsby says this, unless we know who the enemy is, where he is, and what he can do, we'll have a difficult time defeating him. He's a real spiritual being. The Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, the book of Ezekiel, give us this description that he was potentially one of the most beautiful creatures that God ever designed, perhaps the one who led the chorus of worship in heaven. But in rebellion, in rebellion, became the enemy of God and deceived a third of those angelic hosts that would have been in the presence of God. A third. He's pictured throughout the Bible as a serpent, as a dragon. Jesus called him a murderer and the father of all lies. 2 Corinthians says he's the God of this age. In 1 Peter, we're told by that disciple of Jesus to be sober, to, to be alert, because your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The half-brother of Jesus, James, in James chapter 4, tells us that we should submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. This is what I'm trying to say. The devil's been a problem, Right? He delivered those groceries to that woman, which is great, but since Genesis chapter 3, the enemy has been a part of humanity's story. We're coming to some point in the book of Revelation that is amazingly pivotal and important. The devil is finally judged. Here in Revelation chapter 20, we read that God will ultimately defeat and judge the devil once and for all. But here's the dynamic. Before he does that, God will have one final purpose for Satan at the end of the millennial reign. Look at verse 7 and 8 once again with me there in chapter 20. When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be led out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog, and in every corner of the earth, he will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. Satan will be let out of his prison. And just as before, he'll do what he's always done 
he'll deceive. He'll deceive. Now, the author of the book of Revelation, John, tells us that these nations called Gog and Magog, in every corner of the earth, that's who he'll deceive. You say, well, who is that? Gog and Magog. Now, remember with me that much of the content in Revelation, somewhere around 70% of what's in the book of Revelation, reaches back in some sort of symbolism, illustration, or reference to the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, we're introduced to Gog and Magog as these prophetic enemies of Israel. Perhaps this, this battle that happens between them right before or during the tribulation. So what John is doing here, saying that, listen, the, the people of Gog and Magog from, from all corners of the earth, he's describing what's to come at the end of the millennial reign with this description those Gog and Magog, those who are against Christ, those who come against him, whose hearts aren't for him. Now, this is extremely interesting. Think about this with me for a minute. Those who are being deceived by the devil, they're millennials. No, 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 not the generation that's present. No, no, no. I'm not naked, no. They come out of the millennial age. Why, why is that interesting? the earth is going to be returned to an Eden-like stake environment. A thousand years, a thousand years will be marked by tremendous peace. Pastor John read from the book of Isaiah and other Old Testament references last week to give description of what this time will be like, where, where kids can like play with scorpions, right? The wolf and the sheep can lie down and they both get up, right? Where it's peace. Jesus is actually literally ruling and reigning. Those living during that time will experience an extended lifetime, according to Isaiah chapter 65. And assumptively, here's what's happening. People will still get married, have children, raise families, and population on the earth could swell to great numbers. But here's the thing. In spite of those idyllic conditions, there's still a problem. That little thing called sin nature. One author puts it this way. While the saved survivors from the tribulation are born again believers, every person born after the millennium begins will need to find salvation by placing faith in Jesus Christ. No one is born a Christian. Everyone must be born again. Those offspring who are born during the millennium are unsaved unless, unless and until they trust Christ as their Savior by faith. This is what's interesting. Even amidst the most perfect scenario on earth that earth has ever experienced, finally got the right leader in place. Finally, the environment is being taken care of in the way that it should. Finally, everything is aligned how it should be. What does it say in verse 8? He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth, and he will gather them together for a battle, a mighty army, as numberless as sand along the seashore. That's interesting to me. A number of people, too great to count, who, who grew up as, and again, no pun, but, but as millennials, so to speak, in this time, will be deceived by the devil and turn against Jesus. In an environment which there's perfection, Jesus leading, there will still be those who rebel. Because you can look good on the outside and still be rebellious to God on the inside. Two authors that I love and so thankful as we've been walking through the book of Revelation. Let me just read to you what they share. Warren Wearsby says this, In one sense, the millennial kingdom will sum up all that God has said about the heart of man during the various periods of history. It will be a reign of law, and yet law will not change a man's sinful heart. Man will still revolt against God. The millennium will be a period of peace, perfect environment. A time when disobedience will be judged swiftly with justice, and yet in the end, the subjects of the king will follow Satan and rebel against the Lord. 
A perfect environment cannot produce a perfect heart. David Guzik said, For all of human history, man has wanted to blame his sinful condition on his environment. Of course, the way I turned out the way I did. Did you see the family I came from? Did you see the neighborhood I grew up in? With the millennial kingdom of Jesus, God will give mankind a thousand years of perfect environment with no Satan, no crime, no violence, no evil, or no social pathology. But at the end of a thousand years, man will still rebel against God at his first opportunity. This will powerfully demonstrate that the problem is in us, not only in our environment. My greatest need, your greatest need, our greatest need is a Savior, a Savior, someone who can save us from the power of sin, who can satisfy the required penalty for sin, and a Savior, as we're reading about this morning, who one day will deal with ultimately the presence of sin amongst us. And it's a very personal need that we have. You can grow up with the greatest environment, the greatest opportunities, the greatest role models and examples, and still the need for each and every single one of us is to recognize personally that we need Jesus as our Savior. This is amazing to me, that that those that grow up in this time, given every opportunity... Still, sin within the heart is that which needs to be dealt with. Verse 9, John describes what begins to happen. He says, I I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. He's speaking of Jerusalem. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. This horde of deceived individuals surround the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of the millennial reign. And just like we saw with the battle of Armageddon, there's really no battle at all. God deals swiftly with that final rebellion. Fire falls from heaven to devour and destroy all those who come against Jesus. And we come to one of the greatest moments spoken of in the Bible. Verse 10, Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I don't know that I've ever smelt burning sulfur, but I've smelt sulfur. No, thank you. Joining the beast and the false prophet, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Have you ever heard someone say, when the devil tries to remind you of your past, remind him of his future? This is the future right here. The greatest tormentor spends an eternity in torment, the lake of fire. John tells us that the beast and the false prophet are there from a thousand years earlier, giving us insight to this is not something that you're thrown into and then you're just done away with, but it's an ongoing, eternal torment. And when people say, you know, or when they think of hell, this is ultimately what we're talking about, this lake of fire. And it's not a place where the devil is ruling and reigning. It's a place of punishment. One author says this, he says, in addition to being called the lake of fire, hell is called a place of outer darkness. Consequently, the torment in a place so dark that even the flames of the lake of fire don't shed any light isolation and torment. John Wolvert, a a wonderful end times Bible commentator, said this, there would be no possible way, he's thinking of the way that John would have been writing this passage, in the Greek language to state more emphatically the everlasting punishment of the lost than here in mentioning both day and night and the expression forever and ever, literally to the ages of ages. The devil finally is judged, thrown into that place where the Antichrist and the false prophet were thrown a thousand years before, the lake of fire for eternal torment. 
And church, what we see here in this passage is the ultimate defeat of Satan. Jesus, he overcomes. Wouldn't you agree with me? I mean, the passage itself speaks to this so plainly of the patience of Jesus calling and giving opportunity for all to repentance. You know, oftentimes you'll hear people say, one of the biggest challenges I have believing in a God is the presence of, the problem of, so to speak, of evil in the world. And maybe you've heard of like Lex Luthor's theology, right? If God was all good, then he would get rid of evil. If God was all powerful, then he'd be capable of getting rid of all evil. But evil exists, so God is therefore not all loving nor all powerful. That's like the NIV of Lex Luthor's theology. If you don't know who Lex Luthor is, don't, don't worry about it. But there's this mindset, right? Well, if God is so good, why is there thus and so in the world today? Listen, God will one day rid the world of evil. It's in the book. He has the power to do it. Why is he waiting? He's giving opportunity for you and for me to respond, to repent, to be with him forevermore. Of course, God is all loving. There is one moment in history that you can always look back to. We have it in tiled glass, so to speak, here on this stage that demonstrates you once and for all that God loves. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. We sang a song about it this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave. You never have to doubt the love of God. God gave his most precious gift so that you could be in relationship with him. And he wants to extend that gift to every single person. And it's not about developing some kind of utopian society or getting the right leadership in place that will make every wrong right. It's having a heart forgiven and surrendered to him That makes everything right. Jesus overcomes. The devil here we see is defeated and judged. Now let's look at these last few verses of this chapter as we consider the final judgment that is to come. Verse 11. If you're still with me there, let me know by saying Jesus overcomes. Okay, verse 11. I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, and the sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. After the enemy is judged and given over to his final place of torment, the lake of fire, the second death, John records for us what he saw. He says, I saw a great white throne. A throne. A place of authority and power. Great meaning in priority and importance. And white speaking of purity. Right judgment. Righteous judgment. Perfectly just and accurate. And the scene that he describes here is serious. I mean, it says there in verse 11... The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. What does that mean? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know what all that means. But it seems that all of earth and heaven will be moved to make room for a new heaven and earth. That's true. But also the connotation of this language is that there's no hiding from this throne. The the great white throne judgment time has come. And it's like the earth and the sky are seeking to to flee from the presence, and they can't. No one can escape the judgment that's coming. That's what John is writing. 
And John records for us what he saw. He said, I saw the one sitting on the throne. You say, well, who is that? Jesus spoke about this in the Gospel of John. Let me read this to you. We'll have it up on the screen. But John chapter 5, listen to what Jesus says. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, He has given the Son absolute authority to judge, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent Him. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Let me say that again. I I hope you hear that. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. He goes on to say this, and I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed is now. When the dead will hear my voice and the voice of the Son of God and those who listen to me, the Father has life in himself and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son and he has given him authority to judge everyone because he's the Son of Man. Don't be surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son. They will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. Well, what's good? It's back to verse 24 believing in the message of Jesus. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. What we see here in Revelation chapter 20 is what Jesus spoke about there in John chapter 5. Everyone who is not raised in what we saw in in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 20 in the first resurrection, those believers will be raised in this resurrection we're reading about in this portion of John chapter 20 to judgment. Can I, can I say this with as much clarity as I possibly know how? Everyone. That there's no escaping it. That's why John says in verse 12 and 13, I saw the dead, both small and great, great and small, standing before God's throne. He says the sea gave up its dead. Death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. He's saying this, from the famous to to the nameless, from rich to poor, no one is escaping this judgment. Those who reject Jesus here are rising to experience their just judgment. Now, time doesn't allow for me to unpack all of this, but you may be questioning, what do you mean by just judgment? Listen to what the Word of God says. Let me just read a few passages to you. Romans 5, 12. When Adam's sin, sin entered the world, and Adam's sin brought death, and death spread to everyone. Is anyone here an everyone? I am. Death spread to everyone. For everyone sinned. Well, maybe, what if it's just a little sin? James chapter 2. For the person who's, who keeps all the laws except for one is as guilty as a person who has broken all the laws. And God is love. Is anyone thankful for that? Yes, He's gracious and He's kind. And God is holy and righteous, pure. Don't you want Him to be pure in His love? 115%. Well, if he's to be God, he must be 115% in his righteousness, his standard of holiness. And this next passage in the book of Romans puts it so beautifully. Chapter 3, verse 22. We are made right with God by going to church. Oh, no. (laughs) We are made right with God. What does it say there, church? By placing our faith. What does it say? That's how we're made right. And this is true for who? Everyone who believes, no matter who we are. And then for verse 23, for everyone is sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. And He did this how? This is so clear. Through Christ Jesus, when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. See, chapter 20 This great white throne judgment, this is just judgment for everyone. I should be there at the great white throne judgment. I deserve it. 
to stand before a holy God and give account for my sins. Everyone should. But do you remember what we just read? We're made right with God, though, by placing our faith in Christ Jesus. This is true for everyone. So there's a, a get-out-of-jail card monopoly. There's a, 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 there, there's a free pass here. Who is it for? For everyone who places their faith in Jesus. Because Jesus paid for the penalty for our sins. And John continues to write here in chapter 20 that the books are opened. Several books open, books of works and deeds containing the, the thoughts, words, and actions of every person. And these books aren't being opened to kind of, well, judge whether or not that this person is ultimately guilty, but actually just to evidence the truth that they are. One individual wrote this, the issue is not salvation by works, but works are the irrefutable evidence of a man's actual relationship with God. So these books are opened. And then there's this other book known as the Book of Life. The Book of Life contains the names of those who belong to Jesus. Aren't you thankful that if you belong to Jesus, it's like etched in a book? There it is. Better than any kind of memory maker book you'll get from a special event. Your name is in the book of life. Testimony is there, written and recorded. Warren Wiersbe says of this, he says, the, the white throne judgment will be nothing like our modern court cases. There won't be a judge. I mean, there'll be a judge, but no jury, a, a prosecution, but no defense, and a sentence, but no appeal. No one will be able to stand there and defend himself or accuse God of unrighteousness. That's why it's called the great white. Th this is the perfect judgment. What an awesome scene it will be. Before God can usher in his new heaven and earth, he must finally deal with sin. And this he will do at the great white throne. And John closes with these words in verses 14 and 15. And death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, my, I have uh, six children living in our home. And uh, last week, two of my girls share a room. And the room that they are in, when we first moved in, uh, they wanted it painted dark purple. And it was awesome for about two seconds. We've lived there for about three years now. So after about two seconds, they, they wanted it painted a different color. So, well, you know, you chose it. You got to live in it for a moment. We're not changing it right away. But just recently, we, we had the room repainted. And the girls love it. But when you step in that room, you can still kind of smell a little bit of that hint of paint. Or you've had the windows open, you've had the fans blown, but you still kind of, it'll take time for it to go away. What God is doing here in his grace and his mercy is removing every single scent of sin. Anything that sin ever touched is going to be done away with. Death and the grave are thrown into the lake of the fire. The very last evidences of sin's effect upon the world are finally done away with. If you know Jesus, how many of you would say that in and how difficult this chapter is, it's also glorious. Like the devil's finally defeated. Every little scent of sin, every ounce of that it's impacted on this earth will finally be judged. If you don't belong to Jesus, this is terrible. And see, this, isn't, this is where like we as preachers or Bible teachers or as Christians have this perspective that if you don't know Jesus, there is a judgment that's coming. It's not something we're making up. It's something that comes from the authority of God's word. And if you've been traveling with us at all through the book of Revelation, you see that it's not this God who's just on tippy-toe who can't wait to finally judge sinners. It's a God who's full of mercy and justice and love and for time and time and time has given opportunity for repentance. But if God is love and he is, he's also just. And you want him to be. 
You want him to deal with sin. And this lake of fire is the ultimate place for those who don't belong to Jesus. In commenting on this, Wearsby says this, you can escape this terrible judgment by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. By so doing, you will never be part of that second resurrection or experience the terrors of the second death, the lake of fire. And he quotes Jesus, which we read earlier from John chapter 5. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death to life. And he poses with this question, have you trusted him and passed from death to life? Remember that passage from Romans chapter 3, we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. No matter who you are. See, this morning we really see the culmination, the the climax, the completion of God's judgment. God's judgment upon sin. We see that Jesus overcomes the final effects of sin upon the world and brings that judgment to the devil and those who choose to reject him. What's our takeaway? Listen, we didn't get into this at all this morning, but as believers... I think it should warrant a fresh surrender of our hearts to him. There'll be other books that are open for believers, right? That beam a seat of judgment where what you do, believers, if I, can, if I can have your attention, if I can see your eyes, what you do right now matters. How you live your life, how you spend your time, the opportunities that God gives to you. God's going to judge the motives of our heart and all those things. As believers, this should motivate us to a fresh sense of surrender of our lives. God is holy. Listen. Be pliable in his hands. And for all of us here, those that know Jesus and don't know him today, know that you know that you know that you know that you belong to him. It's too like... Crazy of a thing to deal with just haphazardly. Well, I think I'm a Christian. Man, did you read the book? God is so gracious and so kind to call us to a place of repentance. And Jesus overcomes sin and death and the grave and brings final judgment. But here's the thing that Jesus does. He offers opportunity for you to respond. He won't make you surrender to him. So as we close this morning, I want to encourage you. This is your opportunity to know that you know that you know that you belong to him. In church, be encouraged. Jesus overcomes. The devil will be judged. And everything that sin and death and corruption have touched in this world will be done away with. That that scent of it will be gone.